EPA is the response to selection. So put it graphically again, so now you have the population and you have where the selection is pulling, but the response to selection will not necessarily be in the same direction as selection. So if you see here as the direction of these vectors, uh, the response to selection is much more correlated with G max, which is the maximum axis of variance and not to selection. So that configures a multivariate genetic constraints. So I decided to study this in um, a group of related toads, the Hinagunawabi species complex. And I'm gonna explain why I chose this model in class because they are really cute. So there's some nice stuff about them. First of all, they are distributed mostly in South America and Central America in very distinct habitats which have very distant climates. So just to exemplify for precipitation seasonality, which is gonna be an important variable for this work, um, there is a lot of variation in the species distribution, so the more arid habitats and the much more, uh, less seasonal habitats, much more um, seasonal habitats here. So you have the Caatinga and Cerrado habitats, which are dry and more seasonal, and you have the Chaco and Amazonia habitats, which are less uh, dry and less seasonal. So my first hypothesis concerning that populations or species presenting geographical climates and traits are expected to have gone to adaptive processes. And that these species have uh, large climatic differences from where they're distributed, I expect that species from this complex were subjected to climate-associated selection on their skulls, which is the trait that they're most different. So to treat this, I CT scan uh, around 12 1,200 uh, individuals from 11 species. This is the CERN group which has been using this work. And you can see that they have a lot of variation in their skulls, right? And their taxonomy is basically defined by, by their skulls. So what we did, we placed 22 3D landmarks to extract 21 linear distances, uh, trying to represent the skull variation. So I have 11 phenotypic matrices. So I'm not using genetic matrices in this work. So uh, my new hypothesis is that random drift can explain the differences in, in species skulls. And I'm gonna use uh, quantitative genetics uh, theory for this, in which you expect that the variance between the means of the species is dependent on the time in, in generations, the effective population size, and the variance that you have originally on the ancestral matrix. So represented graphically again, you have your ancestral matrices, which I estimate as a within group matrix, considering all species, and you have the descendant populations that, that forms the between species variation. So for the new hypothesis, I expect that these are proportional between species variation and the ancestral uh, variation. But the alternative hypothesis is that selection explains the differences in the species skulls. So it could be something like this. So the, dif the, the descendant means, the, the multivariate means of the descendant populations, they will make a between species matrix that is not proportional to the ancestral G matrix. So that would configure rejecting the new hypothesis and then I would conclude the selection. So I've done this, but uh, on a simpler model by, defined by Ackerman and Shepard, which use the principal components. So these numbers are the principal components, uh, the directions of, of variance in the G, the ancestral matrix for the most basal node, and the B variance is the means projected on these directions. So I have the species means projections on the principal components of the G matrix. And for the new hypothesis, I expect that the inclination of this regression will be one. So G variance, B variance is proportional to G variance. But what I actually found is an inclination above one, so suggesting a directional selection. And we simulated drift using a pro at all approach, and it does not, it's not inside the 95 confidence interval for drift, so I'm rejecting selections for the most basal node, and what really called my attention is actually um, the PC4 morphological dimension, but I will explain later, which has four times more variance than expected by drift. So I'm really seeing a strong sign of selection on this on these morphological dimension, I'm gonna explore it more. But I then this test for, this is the phylogeny of the group, the molecular phylogeny. Um, I then this test for the nodes in black, so I reject, I reject drift in the three most basal nodes. I just showed the graph for the most basal one. In two nodes, I could not reject selections, so 
It could be drift, but it could be also some other causes. And in the white nodes, I didn't test it because it's not enough species uh, sample size. So I reject drift uh, for the three most basal nodes, and PC4 really called my attention. So now I'm going to use a comparative method in association with this results from translated genetics theory to explore if this uh, variation between species and PC4, which is a contrast between some bones, I will show you uh, later what it doesn't mean, and um, climatic variables, because my hypothesis is related to climate associated selection. So these are the variables that I tested, um, five climatic variables, and I use evolutionary regression, which is based on Ersta and Lubeck model, in which you uh, assume that you have adaptive peaks, which actually are defined by the mean climatic variables of the species. And you can also put um, values for strong and weak phylogenetic inertia in this model. So I'm just gonna show you the result for PC4, which really called my attention. Um, and you can see that the preferred model has strong phylogenetic inertia, but 80% of variation of this morphological dimension between species is explained by variation in precipitation seasonality. So species which are in less seasonal environments have uh, longer blue distances here and uh, lower, shorter red distances here, especially on the nasal bones. And species subjected to more uh, precipitation season that have longer red distances, so they have a rostrum which is longer, also the frontal parietum is longer, and they have shorter blue distances. So they, they are quite different skulls, and these are connected to precipitation seasonality. Uh, to explain to explain a connection, how, can, how can I connect variation in skull to variation in precipitation patterns? So since I'm talking about toads, I'm not gonna talk about diet because they actually eat quite the same thing independent of where they're distributed. But I'm gonna speculate a little bit about snout function because the snout bones were important on these differences. And you, they protect and support the olfactive uh, capsules and you have the olfactive capsules which was shown in 2011 to detect waterborne odors. So uh, I'm speculating that these differences in the skull of the species are related to their reproductive ecology in the way to detect um, water signals to find temporary pools for reproduction and in, in more seasonal habitats you have really few chances to reproduce. So I figured that this is really important for fitness for this species. So the next thing is uh, talking about constraints now. Um, these, these phenotypic matrix of these species have very high trait correlations. So this is the distribution for one species, but it's very similar in others. So you know, in the mean, you have a 0.7 correlation between all traits in the skull. So if I remove size, you can see that it, the mean comes to zero. So very high magnitudes of correlation. And this is due to very high size variation, variation in PC1. So at least 50%, up to 80% of variation in these phenotypic matrices are due to size. So I have another hypothesis now, which is Considering that high correlation of the strain result in concentration of variation in few multivariate directions, I expect PC1 or Pmax to present the highest constraining effect. So my second hypothesis is that species from this complex have their response to selection BAs towards Pmax. So to uh, test for this, I reconstructed selection using the multivariate breeders equation. So in the place of the G matrix, I used um, I used the within uh, species matrix um, and I calculated selection gradients for all the phylogeny. And now I'm going to do some uh, vector correlations to test my hypothesis. So you can have two scenarios. You can have one scenario in which selection is not aligned with this constraint. So Pmax is, will not be aligned with the selection gradient, but the response vector will be aligned with Pmax, all right? And the response will be BAs from selection. But well, you can also have a scenario in which selection is aligned with constraints, and then you will have the selection gradient aligned with both these vectors, but you would expect a higher response between uh, descended and ancestor uh, species. So uh, this is the result of the phylogenies. So here you have uh, the response vector correlation with Pmax, and uh, for red uh, color, you have very high correlation. So, the response vector is very aligned with Pmax, which is size. However, 
For the selection gradient, you can see that none of the selection gradients were aligned with size. So this configures my scenario one. Selection was not for size, but all the responses were BAs for size on these toes. So to conclude, uh, there's a signal of selection on the toes for the special morphological PC4. This variation in PC4 is explained by variation in precipitation seasonality. Most school divergent was in the size direction, yet the selection was not in the size direction, indicating very high genetic constraints. So this leaves me with one question that I think is really important, which is, what is the evolutionary potential of species which present high size variation? So if selection related to climate will not be for increasing size or decreasing size, will these species be able to respond I could expect that in a few generations, if you expect that the dry conditions are going to be much more increased, these are projections for 2060, 2069, I would expect species with high suffrage to not respond in the direction of selection, and maybe they are more threatened due to um, climate change. So I want to thank all the museums that land these species, uh, my co-workers in my lab, uh, Papespi, who founded my research, and thank to you all for your attention. I think I have time for questions. Yes? So you just, you define your principal components first based on this pooled matrix. Yeah. And you found that both the principal components, PC4, stood out. Yes. But if you go back to the data and ask what direction actually had the greatest it's not going to be PC4. I mean, have you tried that analysis? It's not going to be PC4. So between uh, species, it's like 10% in PC4, uh, but PC1 is like 77% of well, the variation what? between species. Okay, but you're, uh, what I'm asking is the climatic uh, relationship that you're explaining with the orange skin and the one guy. What is the trait combination that actually is the most selective, not which PC is closest to the trait combination? So um, I actually done this analysis with other, I only did it with principal components, this analysis. So I didn't do it with single traits, right? Because I was trying to connect with the quantitative analysis. So since I did the quantitative analysis with the species means on the principal components, I also did the evolutionary regression with the principal components. Is that what you were asking if I did some individual trait analysis? No, I, I'm asking about finding the actual multivariate trait that is most selective, not which multivariate trait is closest to a PC that is most selective. This was the question you answered. So anyway. Okay, we can talk later. Okay, thank you. Anyone else?